Okay, uh, so let me start. Uh, today I'm going to talk about an uh, interesting topic that's uh, gravitational force. I'm going to give you some uh, story about how people get the equation of this force. And before Newton gets the gravitational force, um, who just uh, have some idea and how does the force work and how did they um, derive the gravitational force. And I will show some uh, theories from different people. And when they uh, use telescope to watch the star, the motion of planet and the motion of the moon, and then they summarize the data and get some uh, statements. And from the statement, they uh, just summarize the equation to explain the gravitational force. So um, before we start, I think when people talk about gravitational force, um, the first thing um, that gave them, encourage them to study the gravitational force is and uh, the physics of the universe. The physics comes from when people um, raise their head and watch the star uh, in the dark. And the question, a common question is, uh, what's the shape of the universe? And how does uh, uh, the Earth uh, locate in, in the universe? Is the Earth in the center? Or if it is not in the center, what else? is exactly at the center of the universe. So when people didn't have telescope, um, they just get some idea about the shape of the universe. They think the ground is flat, something like this. And this ground is surrounded by ocean. Ocean is very huge. And the sky is like a draw. And this drawing just to show you um, the sky is a circle. And there is a moon, there's a sun and a star, but all the object uh, uh, rotate surrounding the, the Earth. So people believe the Earth is at the center of the universe. And if they just trace uh, the trajectory of the sun, of the moon, and other um, planets, or the um, stars, they just get the, uh, the orbit of this star's a circle and the, the Earth is at the center. And this idea just governed for thousands of years and people call the theory is geocentric model. And they believe Earth is at the center and surrounding the Earth that is moon Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and other stars. So the reason they get this water because the moon is the largest object uh, people can observe. Then the Mercury, then the Sun, then the Mars. And when they look at this fixed stars, and it's just a spot and it's twinkled, so they think um, they should be very far away from the Earth. And a famous guy gave this model is uh, Aristotle. Aristotle was a very famous guy at the time. He's a philosopher and he um, wrote a book and he wrote many physics theory. He believed it's true in the book. But so far, most of his theory, physical theory, was confirmed wrong. But I think this is um, a very important guy in the history of the physics. And he wrote books on um, botany, or taxonomy, economics, physics, and other uh, areas. So he was uh, responsible for a um, cosmological model that latest uh, lasted for 2000 years. So this is a very famous model at that time. Um, um, as I said just now, um, most of his theories was proved wrong, but to prove his model is wrong is not easy because we need evidence. We need evidence to show Earth is not at center. And we need evidence to show 
uh, um, the theory put forward by the ancient people are wrong. So there is a theory put forward by um, Copernicus. He is the first guy um, to critic the geocentric model. And he said that from the tra uh, trajectory of the planet, and he thinks the trajectory of planets are very complicated. So for example, if we watch the Mars on the Earth, and the trajectory of the Mars will be look like a flower. It's a symmetrical, something like this. Uh, it's beautiful orbit, but from the uh, from the math, um, it's very hard to get a mathematical equation um, uh, to describe the orbit of the Mars. But if uh, he put the center, put the sun at the center, then the trajectory of the Mars will be an ellipse circle. So in this case, he said if he just puts the sun at the center of the universe, then most of the orbit, uh, uh, most of the trajectory will be very easy to be solved by a mathematical equation. So this is why he wants to use sun um, as the center of the universe. So far we know this is just the difference of the reference. We can see the earth is at the center. We can also say uh, the sun is at the center, depends on our preference, because uh, we can pick any object as a reference and they should give us the same physics. So the reason um, Copernic wants to use the sun at the center because put the sun at the center, then the trajectory will be very easy. And it's a simple ellipse. But it doesn't say um, geocentric is wrong or heliocentric is, is right. Um, but at that time, this model is, um, is not a good model for the religious people, because that's the re, uh, the error of Renaissance, uh, Renaissance, and the people find that if you have a model that against the traditional theory, um, that's not a breakthrough. Um, they just think you are crazy and uh, you are not uh, uh, a faithful guy uh, for the religion. So at that time. Um, Copernicus um, was not a correct guy to get this model. And most of the theory Copernicus gets is from the math. There's no direct evidence to show the sun is at the center until Galileo mm -hmm. um, invented telescope. When he invented telescope, he used telescope to watch uh, these planets and find that uh, the, the audit of this planet, uh, a circle. And after several years, his student, Kepler, just gets the uh, three statements from observation by using the telescope. Um, he did a lot of observations and used statistics um, uh, to calculate um, the semi-axis of the orbit and the period of the planet. And they also calculate um, uh, the distance from the sun uh, to the planet. And eventually he got three statements and we call the three statements as Kepler's three laws of the motion of the planet. And the first law he said uh, the planets move around the sun in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus. So the first statement is a law about orbit. The orbit is that um, the, the ellipse, ellipse circle, and any ellipse has two focus, right? and the sun is located at one of the focus. And the planet, just surround the sun 
and with different speed at a different position, but the orbit is closed and ellipse. This is the first, uh, first statement from the observation. So this is uh, a lot of data from the telescope, and when he just uh, uh, summarized, he got the orbit uh, is not a circle, but a ellipse. Uh, most of the ellipse circle actually is very wrong. So if you don't do the measurement, you can treat the orbit as a circle. But if you measure the, the lens in this way and in the perpendicular way, you will find uh, the distance is a little bit different. And that's fine, but when we do the simple calculation, we can treat this orbit as a circle. The second law is called the law of the area or the law of speed. And the set, the line that connected the planet to the sun sweeps equal area in equal times. What does this mean? I draw a picture here. Um, the sun is at the focus and the planet is on orbit. If this, uh, the planet starts from here and after 10 days, it arrives here, then we can calculate um, the area from the sun um, to the planet and the area it sweeps is the area of this triangle. We can calculate the area of this triangle. And this area equal to another area when it uh, moves within the same time. For example, it starts from here and after 10 days, it reached here and it also has another triangle, a huge triangle. And you find that these two areas are equivalent. And you can also pick other position, for example, here is a zero day. After 10 days, it reached here and we measure the area of this triangle and this area are the same. So if the time of the planet's move on the object is the same, planet move on the orbit is the same, the area is the same. So we can use this theory to compare the speed. Um, for example, the speed at this position and the speed at this position are different. And if we want to know which speed is larger, we just need to figure out the dis uh, displacement. When the, uh, the planet is far, And to get the same area, the distance, the displacement, at the same time it moves will be short. It's a short displacement. But when the distance is close, okay, uh, the planet and the sun is close, the displacement is long. It has longer displacement. So that means longer displacement at the same time means uh, fast speed. And at the far way, the speed is slow. So that means when the, uh, when the planet is close to the sun, the speed increase. When this uh, planet go away from the sun, the speed decreases. Okay, so this is the uh, second law of Kepler's statement. And the third one is the law of period. From the telescope, uh, another variable uh, Kepler can measure is the period. Uh, how long 
does it take for a planet to orbit the sun? And here is the statement. It says uh, the period, square of the period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. So what's a semi-major axis? Uh, we know for a ellipse, there are two axes. One is a major axis, that's the longest uh, distance on the ellipse. And the minor axis will be shortest distance on the ellipse. So the semi-major axis is the distance, half of the distance, or the longest distance. So this is the semi-major axis. We can use R to represent semi-major. And most of the orbits of the planet and the semi-major axis and the semi-minor axis could be treated as uh, the same thing, major and over minor axis distance. Most of the planets um, have 90%. Uh, hold on. That will be minor over major. Minor over major. So most of the planets have this relationship, larger than the 90%. So only there is exemption, that's the Mercury. The Mercury has a very um, weird orbit. So it's not 90%. So for the Mercury, we can treat this as a uh, uh, ellipse, but for other planets, we can treat them as a circle. So this says the period square is proportional to the semi-major cube, axis cube. So that means uh, this is the quantitative uh, relation between the period and the orbit. Okay. So to help you understand the three laws, I have done some simulations and to help you understand what's going on with the motion of the planet. I use MATLAB, uh, I write some code and I want to help you understand um, uh, the orbit of the planet. And I also calculate the speed. I calculate the coordinates of the planet as a function of time and they show you um, some evidence from the Kepler's law. The first one, I want to show you um, the orbit of the planet. So for example, I have the position of star is at zero and zero. So I put a star at the center of my coordinates and I put my uh, planet at one zero. So at the distance between the star and the planet is one. Okay. Here, I don't have units, but you can treat um, uh, the units very long. It's um, thousands of kilogram or the millions of kilogram, uh, a kilometer, millions of kilometer or thousand kilometer. Okay, let me run this simulation. Set an initial speed. That you can see. <laughs> okay, so um, on the left figure, I draw a star at the center, that's a red circle, and the black stars are the orbit of the planet. And you can find that um, the sun is at one of the focus of this ellipse orbit, and the planet just move. Uh, around the, the sun, and this orbit is close. And you can find that it's not a circle, it's not a perfect circle, uh, it's an ellipse. And the sun is not in the center, but at one of the focus. This is uh, uh, one of the simulation. Okay. Then I want to confirm the second law. It says 
the area is the same at the same time. So I take the same time steps to calculate the uh, area. So here the area and the time, and you can find the area is flat. And how do I calculate the area? I show you some example. Let me run a little bit more. Then okay. find this. I get some points, and this point has the same time step. Then I measure uh, the area of each triangle. Here, I just connect the sun and the planet. And I connect the sun with the planet at the second time, the second time step. Then I can measure uh, the area of this triangle. Then I get the first point. First point here is around 0 0.02 uh, something. Okay. Then I do the second calculation and measure the second triangle, second area of this triangle. Then I have a second triangle and I measure the area, I get a second point. Then I do the same thing and measure the area of the third triangle and I get the third point. Then I ask the computer to repeat this measurement and I get a series of the points for each step around this simulation. So in this case, you can find that the area is a flat curve. That means the area is conserved. If the time step is the same, the area should give you the same value. This is very important because we can use uh, the value of the area and to determine uh, the speed at different positions. And you can find that the speed at here is faster than the speed at here. I can play this uh, simulation one more time to give some idea how the speed looks like. I give you larger speed and to show you how does it look like. You can find that at this time, the speed decreases. You can just check the distance between two points. And at the same time steps, as the distance becomes smaller when it goes far away from the, uh, the center star. When it uh, goes back, and the distance between two points increase. So in this case, um, you get some idea. About the speed. And you can find that uh, this two points has a larger speed, uh, has a larger distance than this two points. So that means as this region, the speed is faster than that at this region. Okay, this is the second law uh, simulation. And for the third law, I need to measure um, the period, the time, and the distance of the axis. Okay, the major axis. Here is how I do the experiment. I just plot uh, the x coordinate of the planet as a function of time. Then from the curve of the um, Coordinate. I can find the period of the motion and also uh, the distance um, of the axis. Here is the simulation. Okay, you can find that on the left. That's the uh, uh, the orbit, and on the right is the x component of the planet as a function of time. The x component is the x coordinate. So I just record the x co coordinate as a function of time. And you can find that when the uh, planet goes back, and uh, the x component goes back. So this is a periodic motion. So from the periodic motion, this curve 
we can get um, the distance of the major axis. That's the amplitude of this oscillation. And also I can measure the period from the peak to the peak. That's uh, uh, the period. So let me take a pause. And you can find that. Um, the planet start from here, the coordinates, let me just show you the coordinates. You'll find the coordinates of X is one. Okay, so it start from one. And when this guy moved to here, it has a new coordinate. The coordinates is minus 2.5. So that means the lower lower support here is minus 2.5. Uh, okay. And when this planet goes back, I have the period. When it goes back here, so I can measure the time here. The time is 15. Okay. So after 15 steps, uh, the planet finish a circle. So this is the first period and the first data for the axis. So I can record this one. Record this one like right here. The major axis I use R to represent. So we just measured that's at uh, three point seven. Let me double check. That's the distance from here to here. This is uh. 2.6, around 2.6. Okay, 2.6, and this is what, so the 3.6, 3.6, okay. And the period is 15. Okay, this is the first data that we have. Let me repeat this simulation to get more data and to confirm the capture third law. So I'm going to change the speed. I decrease the initial speed and you will find the orbit will go small. Okay, so the second simulation you can find the, the orbit becomes small. I just decrease speed. Okay. If the orbit goes more, the period should become shorter. Let's take, okay, it goes back. So I'm going to uh, stop the simulation. Okay, let's measure. Measure the axis and the period. So the second curve is this one. Let me change another color. <clears throat> another color. Um, okay. Okay, I, I can change all the color. I have to change this one by one. So that's fine. So for the second one, this is the curve and the distance from here to here, let's see. Um, hold on, let me measure this one. The distance is 1.5 and the start from one, so the 2.5. How about the period? The period is nine, okay? Period is nine. And we call here and um, the major axis is 2.5. Double check. Okay, 2.5. Okay. Uh, let me repeat the simulation. For two more points, I decrease uh, this value. Um, oh, 
Oh, hold on. Let me share my screen. So um, I'm going to decrease the initial speed and change another color. That will be easy. Red. I use a red color and let me repeat the simulation. Okay, you can find the red star. And this orbit becomes smaller and the period become also shorter. The red point. Okay, when it goes back, I'm going to stop the simulation. Okay. So after I stop the simulation, let's measure uh, the distance. So the distance from the left point to the right point, that's uh, minus, minus one, and this is one, so that's two. How about the period? Period is 6.2. Okay. Period is 6.2, and the major axis is long is 2. Hold on. Okay, and one more point. I'm going to decrease the initial speed one more time. Put an eye, then get a new orbit. Change the color to get the blue. In this case, I should have a smaller, smaller orbit. Okay, so you can find this orbit becomes smaller, and the blue curve show you another shorter uh, period. Okay, it goes back and stop. Let me measure the distance. Oh. Okay, the blue curve gave me the distance. That's minus six eight, so that's one point six eight. And the period is five. It's four point eight. Four point eight. One six eight. So the axis is one six eight, and the period is four point eight. Did I get it right? Four point eight. Okay. Yeah. So I have four points. I have the major axis, uh, four point six point uh, three point six. 2.5, 1.68, and I have four periods uh, relative uh, to the axis. I have 15, 9, and 6.2, and 4.8. And I'm going to plot um, this four point into the same curve. I, have the, I need to get the semi-major axis. So I'm going to divide by two, at the semi-major semi axis and versus to the period. And I'm going to use uh, points. In this case, I get four points. Okay, I got four points. Looks like the, uh, in the same curve in the same line, but if we do uh, the basic fitting, and you will get a linear line. And it looks a little bit good. Um, okay, that's fine. But I'm looking for a better fitting. And can we increase the R square? Let me take a look. So if I use Kepler's law, I'm going to plot Uh, the R cube, the R cube, I'm going to use R cube and period square. And I get um, 
a new curve and I'm going to fit. A fitting line. And same, yeah, they're the same R square. Okay. Um, so you can try to use other data and find that if you get more data, this fitting will be better than than the first fitting, okay. even though they have the same R square. But I just show some simple fitting, and eventually we'll find that if you get more data, and this data will uh, be fitted by uh, R cube and the period square. That will be a better fitting. And most of the times, we're going to use uh, Kepler's third law uh, to get the fitting. And you'll find that this fitting will uh, not do that this one. But uh, same from, from now, uh, the linear could be uh, accept. But for more data, if you have a Mercury's uh, orbit, you'll find that uh, the cube and square relation will be better. Okay, so this is simulation. I'm going to stop this sharing and go back to my lecture notes. So from Kepler's law, um, we need to get uh, the force um, between two objects. So we know if the sun is at the center and the earth is here, and we want to know how large the gravitational force between the sun and the earth. Um, so let's do the free body diagram on earth. We know the earth orbits the sun and the trajectory could be treated as a circle. So the only force on the Earth is a gravitational force. That's F, is a gravitational force. And we don't know the formula of gravitational force. So I just use capital F to represent the gravitational force. And this is equal to MA. It's a Newton's second law. And because it's a centripetal uh, motion, we have a centripetal force and centripetal acceleration to calculate the acceleration. And from this um, centripetal acceleration formula, we know this is equal to two pi over period square times the radius. Suppose the Earth orbits the sun with a constant r, constant distance. So we have f equal to mass, two pi square, period square r. So this is a centripetal motion, this is a circular motion, and uh, net force equal to centripetal force. And from the Kepler's second, uh, third law, we know period square proportional to the radius cube. That's the radius cube. So we can just write down equation period cube uh, period square equal to a constant times the uh, distance cube here is a constant so we can replace the period by using the distance so this will be equal to mass 2 pi square period equal to k r cube times r then the r will be cancelled reduce it by a factor of one. So eventually the force is proportional to the mass of the earth, right? mass of the earth, divided by the distance squared, the times are constant. And this is a centripetal force. Uh, no, no, this is a gravitational force on the earth. From the Newton's third law, we know the sun will get an uh, equivalent gravitational force. And the sun will have the same force like the Earth. And it's the proportional to the mass of the sun and the distance squared. And we know the gravitational force 
uh, reaction and action pair force. So this is equal to the force of the Earth, proportional to the mass of the Earth over the distance given. Okay, then we can combine these two relations into one equation. That's the force. The gravitational force is proportional to the product of the mass, sun and the earth over the distance scale. So this is uh, uh, Newton's gravitational force formula. And to write down this relation into an equation, we just need to use the force equal to the mass multiplication over distance square times the constant. The constant is called gravitational coefficient. So here is Newton's gravitational law. So any two objects um, can attract each other by the gravitational force. And the gravitational force depends on the product of their mass and the distance square in between. But the Newton cannot get the value of the coefficient. This constant is very weak. Because this is very weak, so we cannot measure the gravitational force between two people. Then we measure the force, then we get the mass of each people, and we know the distance between two people, then we can find uh, the coefficient. Um, because the coefficient is very small, so we cannot feel the gravitational force from the other people. You cannot attract the guy um, from your roommates or from your classmates. Uh, there's no way because the G is too weak. And so uh, Newton just leave this equation in the book without telling the value of the, of the G. So after Newton published his book, there is another guy, the British scientist, and he used experiments to measure the G. This G is very small. So you can find the magnitude is 10 of negative 11. So when this guy uh, called Cavendish get this value, um, people realize the gravitational force is too weak. So there's no force or the force could be neglect uh, between two people. And until the mass is very huge, like the Earth, the Earth has a mass of uh, 10 to the 24 kilogram. So in this case, the Earth can attract the object close to the Earth. Um, okay, so Cavendish is the first guy to measure the, the mass of the Earth, because we know everything has an acceleration close to the Earth. The acceleration is 9.8 close to the surface of the Earth. So this is a uh, net force. The net force is a gravitational force. So close to the surface, the gravitational force is equal to the mass of the object times the mass of the Earth over the distance between the object and the center of the Earth. That's the radius of the Earth. Square and times the G. And you can find that um, the mass of the object gets canceled. So the acceleration close to the surface is equal to the G, Earth, mass of the Earth, radius square. Okay, and this is equal to 9.8. And we know this is 9.8, we can measure. The radius of the Earth we know is uh, 67 kilogram. Okay, and because we don't know the G at the Newton's area, so we don't know uh, the Earth, Earth's mass. But when Kevin D should get this value, so G is no, so mass of the Earth could be solved.
So Cavendish is the first guy to measure the mass of Earth. So they're very important. And uh, from this equation, we can not only measure the, the mass of the Earth, we can also measure the Earth as the mass of the sun. So think about that. The mass of the sun could be treated as um, the gravitational force between the Earth and the sun is equal to the centripetal force of the Earth. Earth. And we know the period of the Earth. So the centripetal of the, the centripetal force of the Earth equals mass of the Earth, two pi over the period of the Earth, then the radius, the radius of the orbit. Okay. And the gravitational force between the Earth and the Sun is equal to G mass of the Sun, the mass of the Earth over radius squared, the distance squared. And you find that the mass of the Earth just cancel. Okay, in, the, in this case, the only unknown is the mass of the, of the sun. So we can solve the mass of the sun. Okay, so this value is very important. And you can find this value on the equation sheet you don't need to memorize. What you need to know is uh, the force is proportional to the product of these two project, uh, these two objects' mass and the distance squared. Okay, so I think uh, this is what I'm going to talk today. Um, I just introduce the history of the gravitational force and tell you how to calculate gravitational acceleration close to the surface of the planet. Okay, do you have other questions? Uh, if you don't have questions, um, you're good to go and I will see you next year.